This seminar is co-sponsored by the National History Center, the Wilson Center, specifically the History and Public Policy Program, with some help from my program, U.S. Studies, and also the Society for Historians of Foreign Relations, Schaefer, and we thank all of our co-sponsors for their support. In keeping with the mission of the Wilson Center to facilitate dialogue between scholars and policymakers, this series features scholars whose work provides historical, perspective on, historical perspectives on international and national affairs. And today's seminar is very much to the point. Catherine Lynch, one of America's leading historians of France and of Europe more generally, focuses her research on the roots of the modern welfare state, roots that she traces back to the private charities and public welfare institutions of the early modern period, and in so doing illuminates the ideologies and practices of the past and prompts us to consider continuities and discontinuities with the present. As a historian, one occasionally finds oneself suffering from what I call research envy, not only because someone else has hit on an important topic or an ingenious approach, but also when they're able to do that research in an, or their writing in a way that seems thoroughly enjoyable. And Catherine Lynch is someone whose work does that for me. Not only does she grapple with questions about the relationship between individuals, families, welfare, society, and politics, questions that, in my mind, are essential to our understanding of both past and present, but she gets to do it in France. What could be better? Now, I realize it's not all Beaujolais and Chevre. Kate is a very dedicated and hardworking social historian whose many publications and presentations have prompted rethinking in the several fields in which she works. Her research lies at the intersection of family history, historical population studies, and the history of charity and welfare institutions in the European past. By creating a dialogue among these fields, she's been able to develop a rich and supple understanding of early modern and now modern European society a dialogue that breaks down the artificial dichotomy between public and private, indeed thoroughly historicizes it, and in so doing offers many new insights into the ways that people interacted and became interdependent at multiple levels and through multiple institutions in the periods she studies. And as I suggested at the outset, these insights also have important bearings on our understanding of contemporary policies and ways of thinking about social welfare. Kate has published numerous, published numerous books and articles, which you have listed on the uh, bio that you have in front of you, including Family, Class, and Ideology in Early Industrial France, Social Policy in the Working Class Family, 1825 to 1848, and Sources and Methods of Historical Demography. Her latest book, Individuals, Families, and Communities in Europe, 1200 to 1800, a small undertaking, The Urban Foundations of Western Society, shows how, as the size of families and households shrank, the need for greater dependence upon people and institutions outside the family grew, giving rise to a myriad of ch charitable organizations and other public endeavors, secular as well as religion, religious, that came to constitute what we now call civil society. Among the many important points Kate makes in this book, let me single out just two, that the origins of civil society go back much earlier than most scholars taking their cue from Habermas tend to think, and second, that the nature of the relationship between charities and their beneficiaries varied considerably and was not always as hierarchical as we might suppose. I could go on extolling the virtue, virtues of this rich and fascinating book as well as the rest of Kate's work, but it's more important that we hear from Kate herself. So uh, first, let me turn the floor over to our inspirational co-coordinator, Roger Lewis of the National History Center. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, Kate, we ask each of the members of the seminar to introduce themselves to you. Uh, usually, sometimes anyway, we go beyond this and we ask whether they could comment on books that they've been reading recently and it occurred to me that it might be interesting for each one to uh, say what their present views on the French Revolution might be. Uh, I'm all ears. But uh, I'm afraid uh, if we were to do this, this wouldn't leave much time for you to actually give your talk. So I uh, would uh, ask. Too early to tell. Too early to tell. Uh, so we'll make an exception, though, with Charlie and let him uh, give his views of the French Revolution as well as introducing himself. That was Joe and Lai, of course. He said it was too early to tell. Uh, I always liked Macaulay and the berry, you know. It tasted great. Then one was violently sick. Then one thought it wasn't so bad. That's enough. I'm Charles Mayer. Uh, it's been a long time since uh, Kate and I were at Harvard together, but it's great, great, to, see, great to see her. And here. 
what am I supposed to do Just with it? Just say who you are. And I My know. name's Catherine Norris. I'm a, a, I work on modern French history, and I'm a visiting scholar at Johns Hopkins. Hi, I'm Kimberly Sims. Uh, I actually work on 20th century U.S., and I teach at American University. Hi, I'm Lisa Leff. I'm a French historian at American University. I'm Richard Keisel, <clears throat> French historian at the BMW Center for German and European Studies at Georgetown. Bilal Siddi Sudhir at the American Historical Association. Paul Foreman, uh, cultural historian of science at the Smithsonian. Don Wolfensberger, director of the Congress Project here at the Wilson Center. Mel Leffler from the University of Virginia, and I'm a public policy scholar at the Wilson Center this year. James Sang, retired. Stephen Kramer, I'm also at the Wilson Center this year. Uh, Nancy Berlog, I'm with the Historical Office of the Secretary of Defense, but I have studied uh, French history in the past. Uh, Mark Fry, I'm uh, also a public affairs scholar here at the Wilson Center. Steve Lipson, a grad student at Catholic University, all from Pittsburgh. Robert Bemis, Foreign Service, retired. Dick Arndt, retired cultural diplomat. Alice Pinot, working at the international, um, Cold War International History Project here. Uh, Andrew Bedell, I'm the U.S. Studies intern here at the Wilson Center. Katrin Schulteis, I'm a French historian at George Washington University. Megan Myers, I'm just finishing my dissertation at Boston College. Jennifer Jones, research assistant for Aaron Miller. And I'm Christian Osterman here at the Wilson Center. Uh, this is wonderful to have so many uh, French historians. Uh, Kate, rethinking the history of the French welfare state. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to come before you today to offer my reflections on the long-term history of the French welfare state. Is this volume okay? All right. um, it is a daunting task, of course, uh, this uh, reflection, and one that I take on for a specific uh, reason. I'm currently at work on a project designed to understand the workings of the French poor relief system of the 19th century and eventually its relationship to later developments of the 20th century when the welfare state as we know it was born. I'm studying three different sorts of social problems and their related policy solutions. Uh, first, uh, the first one involved the problem of mothers or parents of newborns who found it impossible to raise the child, usually because of poverty. The second uh, problem I'm looking at is um, the one of the local poor who were, had homes, were living in actual homes, and the welfare bureaus that were used to aid them in a system of what we refer to now as outdoor relief. These are the so-called bureaux de bienfaisance, uh, local welfare bureaus. These welfare bureaus were funded um, from a mixture of local government subventions and voluntary associations, uh, uh, as voluntary donations, rather. Finally, I'm interested in institutions for the care of the poor and the sick, mainly the elderly, in local hospitals or hospice, um, this representing a form of indoor relief. In this presentation, uh, however, I want to do um, uh, several things. Uh, first, uh, I'm going to argue that this is a particularly interesting moment to be rethinking uh, the history of the French welfare state in long-term uh, perspective. Um, by exploring older and more recent views of it. I'm going to also be looking at um, debates uh, about the growing number of poor, of the poor, uh, in the midst of plenty and the role of non-state organizations uh, in France to care for them, and also new trends in historical scholarship that also make it a good time to rethink uh, the welfare state. After considering these three kind of in influences uh, on my work, and uh, I'm then going to focus more on my actual research for you. And I'm going to be using in the body of my talk illustrative examples of policy and social problems from the first of the set of uh, problems I referred to uh, 
meaning uh, the problem of mothers or parents' burden with young children. That I'm going to be drawing my examples from that part of my work. Uh, in addition, uh, toward the end of the talk, I want to make some uh, comparisons between the French, uh, French conditions I've been talking about and English uh, poor law system, uh, which I find an extremely interesting comparison uh, in itself. Uh, all right, then. One of the uh, points I'm trying to make in my work uh, is the historical depth of different policy commitments uh, over time uh, that we see in working in French history. Here I find the model of so-called path dependency uh, potentially quite useful uh, in my work to show the 19th century antecedents of 20th century policies such as France's well-known allocation familiale, family uh, grants that were uh, also designed to help women and couples pay for the costs of childbearing and child rearing, I will have occasion to refer back in time to even older manifestations of the idea that communities of various sorts, including the national community, felt uh, obligations to aid their members. Turning now to the welfare state and thinking about the welfare state itself, Although historians cannot take into consideration events that occurred after the ones uh, that we're trying to understand, in my case, mainly the 19th century, studies of 20th century welfare states, especially France's, are of great interest to me. This is because of the simple fact that political scientists, sociologists, and historians who have studied 20th century welfare states are themselves eager to reach uh, to search out the historical roots of welfare state formations. They seek to construct plausible narratives of how these states and their policies came into being. To do this, they have had to take a look back, usually at the 19th century, and place policies of that period into some sort of relationship with 20th century developments. In pursuing my own research, I've naturally wanted to see how experts on the 20th century view the period of greatest interest to me, that is France, roughly from the Revolution to the 1880s, although I'll be talking about an even earlier period, up to the middle of the 19th century today, principally. As I've been building my own interpretations of this era, especially of the period between the end of the Revolution and the middle of the 19th century, I've been struck by the fact that in many narratives that look back from the post-World War II welfare state, practices and policies that are central to my study seem to stand only as embarrassing failures that contrast sharply with those of the modern welfare state, as if the construction of the welfare state had to destroy uh, all vestiges of programs of assistance that went before it. With some exceptions, there is a tendency to produce historical sketches with the theme of from X to the welfare state, uh, uh, some kind of uh, long narrative that, inhaled, that entailed rather uh, huge paradigm shifts, as we call them today. This sort of approach is entirely consistent with T.H. Marshall's famous meta-narrative, as we would now call it, call it, of the growth of the welfare state and of citizen entitlements which grew from civil to political to social rights. Nonetheless, it's been a bit discouraging to see that the policies I'm interested in and began to see as real uh, ancestors of current ones have had little part in the legislatively centered genealogies of the French wel welfare state that others have constructed. These days, however, there seems to be a change in the way uh, that many view the welfare state. Today's studies are less likely to trace an inexorable growth of citizen entitlements and more likely to have such titles as, and these are current, these are real titles, France in Crisis, Reframing Social Citizenship, Recasting Welfare Capitalism, or, or Rethinking European Welfare. Concerns of these studies focus mainly on the growth of poverty among identifiable sectors of the population, especially first and second generation immigrants, the young and women. They focus on the intensification of long-term unemployment and underemployment, 
with some, uh, some writers attributing these trends to forces of globalization, while others blame policies of welfare states themselves. I believe uh, that it simply made sense uh, now looking at this body of literature. It simply made sense to write optimistic, state-focused accounts of modern welfare systems in the period between the end of World War II and the 1980s. It made sense to focus on contrasts between growing citizen-based entitlements to an assured future without perhaps sufficiently acknowledging the contingent dependency of these entitlements on solid economic growth, as was the case uh, in France during uh, France's so-called Trente Glorieuse, the 30 years between the war and the first uh, oil shock. It was logical to emphasize deep dichotomies between previous centuries of poor relief and a new regime of social security, establishing a radical distance between an era of private charity and a new age of social citizenship in which all entitlements were public. Increasingly, since the 1980s and 90s, governments of different political stripes have tried to address manifestations of crisis in the French economy and welfare state. In the view of some critics, however, the long-term unemployed are increasingly bought off by minimal benefits, including the famous RMI, the revenu minimum d'insertion, kind of uh, minimum wage, I guess we might term it, temporary internships or jobs, and forced to spend time looking for work that does not exist and to accept short-term work contracts that lead back mainly to unemployment. The policies seem to be ad hoc ways designed to relieve poverty rather than prevent it. Many commentators have expressed increasing fears that the French welfare system is going down the path toward neoliberalism allowing market forces a greater role. These policies are viewed by many of a sign, as a sign of a movement away from the welfare state's contract to ensure citizens against risk and more towards programs to assist them after they had fallen into poverty, a trend away from what Robert Castell has termed the société assurantielle, the assured, insured society. French efforts to reform basic structures of the welfare state, such as pensions, for the more generously entitled, have elicited well-known waves of public protest by key groups of stakeholders who fear losing their entitlements. Recently, uh, some re uh, observers of social policy have begun to focus on aspects of French poverty that seem to exist ben below, beneath and below the normal radar screen of welfare state scholarship. Ethnographic studies of the lives of France's poor, for example, have suggested the need to shift attention away from focus on exclusively public welfare state policy as it is legislated at the center towards the society in which the policy is implemented. When we do so, we find, they find, a great deal more activity than we might expect focused on relieving poverty and a concomitantly greater presence of non-state actors. For example, in a recent article, Alain Clément notes not only that the French so-called resto du coeur, the restaurants for the poor, had fed nearly 700,000 people serving a total of more than 75 million meals to the poor in France in the 2005-2006. He adds that this sort of aid was, quote, far from being marginal, and that, quote, its return is increasingly perceived, including by the state, as a complement to public action. This intervention, he writes, is often judged as, quote, more fraternal, more concrete, it, quote, harkens back in a certain way to charitable practices of the past, end quote. He also mentions a whole host of other voluntary associations intimately related now in the relief of the poor in France. This and other studies uh, also reveal the striking ignorance of local officials concerning the lives of the poor who largely escape France's safety net and whose welfare lies more within the purview of voluntary associations that work both alone and in concert sometimes with the French state. 
one final influence on my thinking today and that I believe reinforces the notion that it's an opportune time to rethink the welfare state is um, uh, the growth of historical scholarship since the 1990s, work by historians, that has also led attention away from legislative chambers and state bureaucracy, where current social policy has its final formulation, to the boundaries between state and civil society, where many policies first emerged. The work of Susan Peterson, for example, demonstrated how important French big business was in the development of systems of worker insurance. We can also cite Paul Dutton's study of the critical role of French mutualists, whose great suspicion of the French state led to efforts to insure themselves against risks of sickness and unemployment. Or the important work, uh, more recently, of Christine Adams or Sarah Curtis and others on the maternalist efforts of urban women engaged in projects they designed to assist poor, respectable, usually respectable, mothers overburdened with young children. Thus, the current crisis of the French welfare state, a growing acknowledgement of the state's dependence, sometimes growing dependence, some would argue, on voluntary associations as partners, at least, in assisting the poor, and a shifting focus of historical scholarship suggests that this is an opportune time to rethink the genealogy or meta-narrative of the French welfare state in a more big tent fashion. Um, I want to also note, and I'll speak briefly about this toward the end of my talk, that the, some of the challenges that are now facing the French welfare state resemble in important ways what French citizens and their leaders faced in the period of interest to me, and I'll try to bring those out explicitly. All right, then, turning much more clearly to examples from my own work. One of the most uh, useful concepts we have for unentangling the history of welfare policies uh, and institutions over the longer term is what Jane Lewis and many others have called the mixed economy of welfare, acknowledging that most systems of welfare or relief of poverty are likely to consist of a diffuse set of approaches, policies, and institutions that evolved over time and uh, from different sources and rationales. Uh, this approach, uh, as an aside, uh, implicitly suggests that we discard what I consider a very brittle dichotomy between public and private in much of the literature on France, uh, and that this dichotomy uh, crippling uh, and distorting our understanding of the longer-term history of French uh, social policy. We know from studies of French uh, current welfare state that it is in fact a hodgepodge of different policies targeting families with children, pensioners, the sick, and secondly, that some of its programs effectively entitle different kinds of people with very different levels of benefits and for different reasons. Commenting on the Jubé reforms of 1995 and their implementation under Jospin, one observer noted that reforms were designed to employ quote, a more pragmatic approach to social protection problems, end quote, and that the system itself, the French welfare system, was in actuality, quote, a patchwork of four models or doctrines, universalistic doctrine for health care, vertical redistribution or citizen so citizenship solidarity for families and poor people, occupational solidarity for pensions and under underemployment benefits, and a market doctrine for private pensions, end quote. This mixed economy of welfare idea, this fact of the mixed economy of welfare, was also true of 19th century French poor relief policies taken as a whole. The prevention and relief of po poverty were founded on multiple bases with programs and institutions that targeted different groups of inhabitants, infants, parents, mothers, households, or the elderly. Policies emerged and developed over time within different political regimes. Various models, approaches, and rationales for care underlay these policies, which involved also diverse players who crafted and carried them out. These included both state and civil society actors. Furthermore, important innovations, some of the most progressive innovations, often came from local programs and non-state actors. Now to turn to, in detail, one part of my own research, and that is 
uh, the programs uh, centering on infants and young children and their parents, especially their mothers, and to trace the antecedents of what I see as the longest enduring part of the French welfare system, and that is the system of what is now called family allocation, <coughs> based on state commitments to parents of infants and young children, and to the children themselves. The central administrative uh, state of the Restoration period, 1814 to 1830, and the July monarchy from 1830 to 1848, hoped to prevent uh, family poverty and save the lives of infants as best as they could. They did this by granting entitlements to parents or single mothers that allowed those parents or single mothers to deposit infants in regional foundling homes, in most instances anonymously. The French state also accepted the responsibility of supporting another category of older, so-called abandoned children, so-called, whose parents had died uh, or absconded and whom relatives would or could not care for. Funding for the programs came uh, mainly through regional, that is, de departmental and local or communal governments, as well as local hospitals that were financed by municipal budgets and voluntary donations. This 19th century commitment from what uh, can be considered as two versions, that is the Restoration and the July Monarchy, of a relatively liberal state formation, at least in uh, welfare terms, itself, this policy itself had historical roots in the absolute monarchy of the 17th century. Systems of aid to infants and by extension their mothers or fathers originated uh, from a combination of royal paternal or royal paternalistic and religious obligations of the kings of France. The paternal concern of the French kings was encouraged and actual help to infants and children carried out uh, by local programs of militant uh, counter-reformation activists, especially maternalistically minded women. Such a model of assistance to poor infants and children and their mothers or families under the old regime was not, however, the only one that was based upon ideas of obligation and entitlements. As we know from studies of certain early modern French cities, assistance to households burdened by children grew to be a key entitlement of local citizens. That is, being a citizen, read, long-term resident, in the French case, of a town could make the household eligible for assistance to help it care for its young children, its infants in particular, by helping pay, for example, the cost of wet nurses. Having too many children was, of course, one of the principal causes of poverty among the settled poor living in European towns and cities. It interfered with the critical contribution of women income earners to the household budget. To judge from poor relief records themselves, the presence of too many children, and we find this in you know, the relief roles. Why are these people receiving relief? They have, quote, too many children, and that can be uh, one or two children. Uh, to judge them from the poor relief records, um, having too many children weighed upon households of the poor, especially during economic crises. Yet it could, yet it, that is childbearing, could create its own crisis for poor households. The life cycle of poor households reached one of its most desperate states during those years when children were too young to work. Disaster struck when the addition of a new child accompanied other predictable life cycle risks such as illness, unemployment, or death of critical income earners. Here, as always, lone women were the most vulnerable that is, women bearing children uh, either out of wedlock or widowed. It seems, however, that mothers of children born out of wedlock were often, or usually, we don't quite know, excluded from these urban systems of what I view as citizen entitlements, which usually rested upon the recipient's respectability, which mothers of illegitimate children did not enjoy. That policy, the urban, local, urban, civic kind of policy, contrasted sharply with royal, the royal government policy of foundling homes, which assumed, often wrongly, that mothers of illegitimately born children were the sole clients of those foundling institutions. 
Thus, a basic commitment to the protection of infants received in foundling homes or cared for out of local civic funds had two quite different ideological foundations, as well as different tools for addressing this, source, this problem. While royal succor targeted the infants and women of the lowest classes without distinction, urban civic programs focused more obviously on the respectable poor, the house poor, uh, the resident uh, urban poor, longer term resident urban poor. The association between aid to respectable poor women and children and local civic activism also informed the work of private or voluntary groups of women working in civil society in the civil society sector in a number of French towns and cities beginning in the 17th century. As detailed most recently in the work of Christine Adams and Sarah Curtis, these efforts grew in the 18th century and extended their reach into many provincial cities as well as Paris, obviously, in the 19th century. Like the urban civic programs I've just been describing of the early modern period, the work of these uh, maternalist charities cut against the grain of the preferred statist solution to the infant care problem, which as I noted, collected foundlings in large urban foundling institutions before farming the children out to rural wet nurses if they survived, which was highly unlikely. Instead, these local voluntary groups of women sought to aid children by encouraging their mothers to breastfeed and raise their own infants at home. They, the activists, maternalist activists, hoped to avoid the abandonment of children to foundling homes. Bourgeois and upper-class women, organized into maternal charity societies, drew on their own money, on voluntary subscriptions, and eventually state subventions uh, for the relief of poor women after childbirth, immediately after childbirth, contributing money, clothing, and a number of other things to them. As I've noted in my own work, which Sonia referred to, thank you. It was this local civic model approach to the outdoor relief of poor parents of newborns that early leaders of the French Revolutionary government in the years 1790 and 91 favored as they tried to make good on their promise to set up a kind of welfare state based on what we now call citizen entitlements. We learn from the magisterial studies of Catherine, uh, Catherine Duprat and other historians that the famous uh, Comité de Mondicité, the Welfare Committee of the French National Constituent Assembly in the years 1789 to 91, applauded the participation of philanthropically or even charitably minded citizens in the relief of the poor and gladly supported their efforts, at least until the money ran out. Uh, and a new kind of revolutionary leadership came to power. The newer Republican leadership, uh, beginning 1792, uh, added its own twist to the older civic policy that had aided respectable women in childbirth. Yet uh, they also drew an increasingly sharp line between public and private forms of assistance that we still t see today, not only in government policy, but in the minds of French people. Second, this new uh, revolutionary uh, leadership, Jacobin leadership, increasingly integrated relief policy into larger concerns for national defense. The departure of menfolk for the Revolutionary Wars in particular, and the discursive appeal of women's contribution to the Jacobin Republic uh, through childbearing and raising good revolutionary citizens made outdoor relief, that is home-based uh, aid, to women a high priority. Soldiers were often reluctant to depart for the war front without assurance that their wives or girlfriends with young children, uh, infants or young children, would be well cared for by the revolutionary state. As historians since Crane Brinton have observed, one important feature of this revolutionary assistance plan for infants and their mothers was the way it contributed to building a new model of the respectable and therefore deserving mother by declaring poor French children in general as wards of the state, enfants de la patrie, 
uh, Republican policy entitled, gave entitlements to not only previous categories of respectable ma women, read m legitimately married women in childbirth, but rather extended its care, at least in principle, as the French say, to all poor women, including those who were unmarried. Records of the period show that revolutionary era mayors of communes all over France supported this kind of relief. Women who had borne the children of revolutionary soldiers were made discursively respectable by the receipt of a form of assistance formerly reserved for women actually counted as among the respectable, at least in early modern society. Entitlement from the revolutionary state itself conferred citizenship and merit on these women at the same time. To move once again into the 19th century to trace the impacts of multiple approaches to the relief of uh, infants and their mothers or families, we find that things did not move in a clear or linear fashion. A more modern absolutist ruler of the French state, that would be the Emperor Napoleon, found his own reasons to reaffirm the state's welfare contract with poor and defenseless children and to revert clearly to the older statist institutions. In legislation of 1911, the Napoleonic state required the construction of institutions uh, in all departements of France for the reception of foundlings, where, whereas previously it had been uh, it had not been obligatory in older, old regime provinces. It now became an absolute uh, obligation for each uh, département to have a family uh, institution. Napoleon's stated commitment to this policy of support for infants was based on old regime precedents, as well as neo-mercantilist or neonatalist raison d'etat. Uh, he hoped that male families could be pressed into military service, always the pragmatist was he in uh, welfare matters, uh, yet uh, as we approach the 1830s and 1840s, we find paradoxically that the greatest support for m maintaining these family institutions, this is what I've called statist uh, solution, came principally from social Catholics who believed that foundling homes and the provision of anonymous abandonment was a safeguard against infanticide. In contrast, by the 1830s and 40s, agents of the central state, such as uh, departmental prefects, sub-prefects, the head of the regional administrations, as well as hospital administrators, were becoming increasingly more focused on budgets that were being st sorely stretched by the huge number of children received in foundling homes. To give some idea of the numbers and the costs, between 1831 and for, uh, 1841, for example, nearly 1,200,000 foundlings were received and cared for by these institutions uh, for a total of over 437 million child days of care and a total of over 96 million francs. Indeed, France's foundling institutions and their associated costs in this period became so notorious that some began to compare this financial burden to England's poor law problem of the same period. This was, as many uh, of you know, a set of legal entitlements to assistance that English men and women had been granted over the years since the Elizabethan period and whose own costs had increased more than 400 percent between 1776 and 1832 from 1.72 million pounds sterling to over 8 million. French state civil servants who wanted to abolish foundling institutions and with them the policy of anonymous abandonment had other very good reasons for doing so. Not only were the costs skyrocketing, but the mortality of the infants was also catastrophically high for a number of reasons we can discuss. The state, these state actors argued, was apparently gaining nothing by the policy. Despite rearguard actions and social Catholics, uh, Catholics' warnings of epidemics of infanticide, state officials began to revise their policy 
gradually reverting to the civic model that I have sketched out that existed in early modern uh, times, which consisted of assistance to women, including single mothers, in their homes, which was less costly and found gradually to be much more conserving of infant life. What is the significance of this sort of excursion I've been taking us on into the twists and turns of policies towards infants and their mothers? How does a deeper historical consideration of these policies inform our understanding, perhaps, of more recent developments? First and most importantly, it is clear that aid to infants and children and their mothers slash families as a separate category of entitled persons has a very long history in France. <clears throat> Part of the history I've explored, I suggest, helps to illuminate a question often asked about the seeming anomaly of the French welfare state, that although it generally conforms to Esping Anderson's model of the, quote, conservative corporatist type of welfare state, it also has a policy of family allocations that seems not to conform to the so-called male breadwinner model, model typical of this and other kinds of welfare state systems. As long ago as the 17th century, I have argued, both royal, statist, and local civic uh, approaches to helping infants implicitly acknowledged that it was the mothers, not the fathers, of poor infants that should be the main targets of uh, relief, either through the large indoor relief institutions like foundling homes, or outdoor relief programs that early modern civic authorities, then revolutionary leaders, and 19th century liberal Malthusian administrators preferred. Certainly, successive policies for infants and their mothers up to the present have been infused with different notions of entitlement and merit and respectability. Uh, and some would argue that the current welfare state is, is not immune from this generalization, since not all inhabitants of the hexagon are considered citizens of the nation in the same way, as evidenced by differing, uh, differing levels of entitlement to assistance from the welfare state. Um, a second uh, point I would bring out is that assistance to women and infants has had a number of rationales ideological defenses and agents that varied over the years. These defenses range from Christian royal largesse to civic ideals of early modern urban governments and voluntary associations to revolutionary national aspirations of the welfare committee of the constituent assembly to the pro-natalism and militaristic fantasies of Napoleon dreaming of all of the sailors he was going to get from the little boys in the foundling home, and finally, the budget-cutting Malthusian values of 19th century liberal uh, state administrators. Inertia might be also mentioned as uh, an important variable here, which, we, which is kind of the down-home word for a path dependency, I think, in the French case. Even those Malthusian-minded liberals with their money-saving concerns who administered the French state during the July monarchy were un unable to undermine completely the multifaceted jumble of rationales that underlay entitlements of infants and their mothers. They were happy simply to be able to move back towards a policy of outdoor relief to women with infants in their home to save money. The third point I would emphasize is that the link between women's status as citizens E even of early modern towns, of local citizenship, and their entitlement to the provision of assistance when needy in childbearing is an old and powerful one. In medieval and early modern cities, local governments and associated voluntary associations were generally held together not by just one, but rather by several rationales for women's entitlements, which were both religiously based and civically grounded involving both government and private actors. These programs and their underlying rationales were not based merely on an ideology of almsgiving or charity that some observers, 
modern observers, mistakenly think was the only ethic of solidarity with the poor characteristic of pre-20th century times. I mentioned at the beginning of my talk that allocations to women and families in the form of services to them at the time of childbearing were not the only policy for the relief of the poor that I'm working on. Others, including the story of the wel local welfare bureaus and hospital uh, assistance to the poor, were designed to face, together with family uh, institutions, some of the same sort of social and economic problems that face the welfare state today. Here I'll just enter now into a bit of comparative dialogue between uh, past and present and then England and France to, to wrap up my talk. Two uh, resemblances uh, between uh, the past and the present strike me as especially obvious. First, between the end of the revolution and the middle of the 19th century, French economic downturns originated in agricultural or subsistence crisis and problems. Yet some of France's economic woes through mid the mid-19th century stemmed at least in part from what today we would term globalization. French industry and French workers in certain key sectors of the economy, such as textile production, were challenged by competition with cheaper goods produced elsewhere and whose importation led to structural unemployment and the wholesale extinction of entire occupational groups. Second, Local economic crises exposed, then as now, problems of migration and migrants. In the 19th century, it was a more occurrence of internal rather than external migration that caught observers' attention and exposed the fact that residents and newcomers had very different levels of what we call entitlements today. The fact that France's poor relief system remained dominated by regionally funded and largely urban-based institutions, such as the foundling homes and hospitals, meant that the mobile 19th century poor, unemployed and underemployed, flocked to places where work and assistance might be more available, just as international migrants do today. Yet, as my comments on civic forms of relief suggested, in migrants lack the entitlements to assistance that existed in towns and cities of the 19th century. The wandering poor, men in particular, were thus more likely to wind up in prison-like institutions, uh, one, the no notorious Depot de Mondicité, for the unentitled poor. Then as now, regional governments scrambled to create make-work schemes for this group to address growing levels of pauperism the, the dependency on government benefits rather than waged work for their subsistence. Thus, historians as well as current observers of the poor in France are doubtless correct to insist upon the uses of these latter sorts of policies um, directed mainly towards politically volatile male laborers to help, and help feed them and their dependents as mainly vehicles of so-called social control we see evidence today of the same kind of two-tiered system of insurance versus poor relief that some observers uh, believe effectively distinguish, distinguishes on the one hand older, whiter uh, French people from younger, browner people's position in the welfare state societies. Finally, I'd like to end on a comparative note uh, an approach that has been so very fruitful in studies of poor relief and uh, welfare systems. In a wonderful comparative article, Timothy Smith demonstrated how important it was for leaders of French society throughout the 19th century to avoid em emulating England's poor law system of what they termed legal charity. That's what the French called the English poor law system, legal charity, which they believed grew to cost such a fortune because it gave English people legal rights to assistance in their communities of settlements rights that the French poor did not have. However, my research suggests that if French people in the 19th century lacked the legal right to assistance that English people had, one that could be enforced by court decision in England, a study of the actual relationships between institutions such as family hospitals or these local welfare bureaus and their female clientels 
uh, in France reveals that the latter very often acted as though they were entitled to assistance. We know from a wealth of scholarship on the topic that poor people and rich people, even more successfully, we might argue, have historically been extremely creative in constructing entitlements out of custom, both real and imagined. Usage and custom over time can recreate rights in people's minds, even if no law so dictates them. France and England may thus not have been as far apart on this issue as once believed. Um, my uh, examination of departmental budgets also suggests, uh, these are the regional governments in France, post-revolutionary France. My examination of departmental budgets also suggests that the French and English systems of relief to the poor may not have been as disparate as some have argued uh, with, on the one hand, England's poor law uh, system being viewed as requiring funding from ratepayers and in contrast, the French one being based mainly on private charity and poor relief. In fact, many uh, French towns as early as the 16th and 17th century routinely levied taxes on the affluent to pay for the relief of their fellow citizens on the basis of both Christian love and civic ideals of solidarity. Um, this continued into the 19th century. French communes and départements were required to share the costs of funding a variety of institutions for the prevention and relief of the poor, including family services, through subventions and taxes that they levied on themselves, quite unhappily, I may add. There are several other interesting approaches suggested by work on England that I hope to develop to enhance my own work. I believe that we will need to take more account of what Steve King in his work on the English poor laws refers to as different regional cultures of relief within uh, the territory he's studying, England that is. Since the pioneering work of Olwen Hofton, we have known how differentially spread were basic welfare institutions across the map of France. Certainly one of the features that the French revolutionaries hoped to remedy through standardization. Um, and those uh, possibly important regional variations must be taken uh, into account. Finally, from the French side, recent work on the vibrancy of certain modern cities' innovative uh, systems of civic relief. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, uh, Marek's work on Rouen or Paul Dutton on Lyon, will need to be considered when trying to uh, account for persi the persisting fundamental relationships between local citizenship and entitlements to assistance. This sort of approach seems especially fruitful today when the devolution of responsibility for the French welfare state is redounding increasingly to its own regions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Just to open the uh, uh, discussion, let me say that I found some of your ideas very, very engaging. For example, uh, when you began talking about the unentitled poor and the question of social control, could you give us some idea about how the system began to cope with increasing numbers of French subjects from Africa and Asia, for that matter, the, uh, uh, the Caribbean? Um, that's th those kind of international migrants uh, coming into France a little bit beyond the period I'm mainly working on at this point. Um, there were, however, uh, international migrants from uh, you know continental Europe. I can speak about with a little more uh, authority. Uh, there were certainly at the border. I'm thinking of the Rhineland border in particular. Uh, policies to Exter to exterminate, to exclude, to expel, uh, not to exterminate, uh, but rather to expel foreign uh, workers, uh, in particular, uh, from the countryside if they were liable to uh, become uh, dependent upon local welfare roles in a kind of emulation of German town and uh, city uh, regulations uh, of the period. So, uh, is in terms of uh, 20th century international migrants, not, not, uh, I'm not as able to comment on that, but perhaps there are people in this room who could comment on 
that stream of international migrants. I'm working more with the internal migrants. Sorry, Sorry. Roger. Um, thank you so much for this, Kate. It's really wonderful. I'm suffering from more research envy than ever because <laughs> um, I haven't been working on, uh, you know, my own work on childcare for a long time. So I really, it really brings it all back. Um, my question has to do with. Um, you mentioned Owen Houghton and her work on the economy of uh, the makeshift. economy of makeshift, mm -hmm. and then you talked about this sort of carving entitlements out of um, custom. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that. Um, and also the, the question of agency. How much agency did the poor have in all of this? And do you see, would you say that that carving entitlement out of custom is sort of part of the economy of makeshift? Is it different? I mean, sort of what's the relationship there? Yes. Um, I think some of the best examples, uh, well, I'll take one example from from the women uh, abandoning uh, their infants in uh, foundling homes, a number of administrators uh, became aware, uh, and hospital administrators, that uh, an increasing number of uh, women were seeing, were using uh, these foundling homes as, as a kind of uh, Childcare. Yeah, childcare, except with regard to the mortality. The mortality was so high that they rarely the, ch the infants rarely survived, uh, the, but we have a lot of evidence where women would leave notes uh, with their infants saying, giving a little bit of background and also uh, claiming that they would return to get uh, their children. Um, could, could they're also could, local, I mean, they're, they're eyewitness accounts of, uh, is particularly in Paris, as one might expect, uh, of people receiving relief from welf local welfare bureaus you know, uh, uh, arguing and gathering on on the day that relief was going to be uh, distributed, and effectively, uh, with their feet, acting as you know agents, uh, as people not ashamed, not holding their head down, but acting as if the uh, you know the welfare bureau of the fifth arrondissement owed them their money that day. They were uh, entitled people. They had been ruled upon, their cases were legitimate, and they were to receive that uh, set of, uh, that, that cash or a pass to go to the doctor or the baths or whatever, uh, that they were entitled uh, to that. Um, th there was a very active, shall we say, relationship between the, the, the men running the welfare bureaus and their clientele. So, um, and did they, did they view this as part of their, an economy of makeshift, which refers to the ability of poor people or the hope that poor people can cobble together relief from a whole lot of sources, the neighbors, their family, a confraternity, if we're talking about the early modern period, the church, a little begging, a, a, a pawning this. Um, you know, I don't have any, I don't know that I have any explicit evidence on that, but there's certainly nothing in the, what I know of the daily lives of the poor in the 19th century that would dispel the idea that they would try multiple, multiple ways to get, get by, including working. I mean, that was the main, of course, the main way. Um, so, but no real explicit uh, examples I can think of of conforming to Olwyn Houghton's model, mm -hmm. though I think that they did. Um, Don Wolfensperger. Uh, Thank you, Don Wolfensperger. One of the uh, programs I believe Sonia had uh, a while back was a comparative one on uh, European welfare state versus America. It was looking at American exceptionalism, but one of the explanations given for the modern European welfare state was that after World War II, there was sort of a trade-off that there would be expanded welfare benefits for citizens uh, to try and stave off any future instability in Europe. And I had never heard that before, but looking back to your antecedents, you mentioned the, the linkage between the wars that were going on and taking care of the, the women and the children while the men were off fighting. Do you yes. see that linkage uh, and looking at the expansion of the welfare state in Europe after World War II that people sort of expected this to stay, stay quiet and calm and, and so on to have expanded benefits? Um, that would 
call for a little bit of speculation, which is fine. That was, I think, one of my, the agenda items just was to speculate on the future of the French welfare state. I hope there are people in this room who are more eager and willing to do that than I, perhaps. But um, my sense is that uh, the French revolutionary uh, entitlements to the wives and girlfriends and so forth of uh, French soldiers was a uh, was a uh, part of a program to ensure that the soldiers would leave to fight the battle rather than to reward them when they came home. Um, so the post uh, warfare uh, post post war welfare state in France, I think I, I guess the way I would look at the increase in family allocations was to to boost the the birth rate rather than uh, rather than make an analogy with the French revolutionary soldiers uh, i 'm speaking of France now since france 's fighting in World War II was a little problematic R right uh, yeah i'm no i mean uh, it, it was i mean that's 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 just um, and so um, my understanding is, again, the, the increase in family allocations was both a continuation of tradition from multiple sources, not just, you know, soldiering, um, but also to uh, main boost and maintain families being built uh, after World War II. Although we note that the French baby boom had started already before the end of the war. Um, so I see it a little. I, I guess I don't see it as much uh, in the line of one of the de, one of the defenses uh, being uh, a military one, so a reward. Of, uh, a communist type takeover if the socialists didn't. Uh, that's there's certainly a, a whole lot of people who would agree with that. That this is again a kind of a social control mechanism. Um, I've written about that again for an earlier period. Um, about this problem, my own work tends to look away from from a social control model, in part because, and, and that's rather unusual. I mean, a, a previous generation of social historians was Michel Foucault and other people were very interested in that model of social assistance. Uh, that model, however, doesn't explain very well assistance to little old ladies and infants, in my judgment, who are not a volatile political force generally, but that those kinds of groups in European society became entitled for other reasons. While it's important to, to understand that certain groups uh, needed to be assisted um, to keep them out of the streets, perhaps. Not all groups did. So um, I think I've not adequately addressed your question, but I, I don't think the, mili the military thing is, was quite as important after World War II, though I defer there perhaps is, again, is somebody in this room who knows, can, can in, uh, speak to that. Certainly in other European countries that where the fighting had been more active, let's say. Uh, I think the citizen soldier coming home from war was seen as a very, very much a respectable object of funding. Yes. One of the most distinct uh, features of the, of the French welfare state is the allocation familiale. And they, that dates essentially from before the Second World War. Yes. That is, those are the Deladi Renault reforms of 38, 39, yes. and then uh, continued by Vichy, et cetera. What, in your estimation, is the historical linkage for those? That is, this, this rather remarkable and, and, and currently one of the most still distinctive features of, of, of French welfare. Is that just about pronatalism? Or is that- It's is, a lot about pronatalism. To your, to your, to your, to the past? It's a lot about Pronatalism, absolutely. Um, the Code de la Famille of 1939, um, uh, very much uh, about uh, pronatalism, um, uh, and it links up. I mean, that that story links up. I, I would say <clears throat> it piles on as yet another way that a different political regime 
very adroitly makes its own rationale for why we should continue, ha why should we should have these policies that, that aid women in childbirth. Uh, it, it's a new, as new regimes come into power, they manufacture their own ideas about entitlement and why we should give certain kinds of benefits, and that those ideas may be quite different from previous regimes, but oddly enough, the, the targeted groups have stayed remarkably the same. That's what I'm, really what I'm arguing. So, yes, uh, inventing pronatalism uh, or reinventing pronatalism, that's sure, that's, that's a good rationale for having uh, uh, these policies. Certainly the French revolutionaries, as good civic Frenchmen, also were pronatalist and, and not in the same way as 20th century French statesmen, but the, the, there's an undercurrent of pronatalism until we get to the, the Malthusian years of the 1830s and 40s when, uh, when uh, prefects and so forth didn't want any more babies from the poor. Uh, so the natalist argument kind of goes underground, but you know resurfaces. So uh, I guess that's uh, what I would say: new, new rationale, new ideology, but same concerns and same objects, same targets of policy. Yeah, I actually wanted to dig a little bit further into some of that stuff because as a we ask people to reintroduce themselves. Oh, sorry. My name's Catherine Norris, and yes. I work on the Third Republic and yes. on the things having to do with uh, older, slightly older children and their education and yes, the future great. citizenship stuff, right. which I think is really certainly important for the the social control aspect of things, mm -hmm. although I agree with you about not wanting to overstress that. In any case, what was very interesting to me about hearing your talk is that from a Third Republic perspective, there were two big things that were missing. One of them was this whole story about um, pronatalism and about worries about declining birth rates, which of course are, become huge concerns for the administrators of the Third Republic, both in the you know in the early period before the First World War, and certainly Absolutely. exploding afterwards. De, po de population, their years oh, yeah. in, in, in the 1890s, yeah, there, just the, to form that where more people died in France than were born. Yeah, which, is, but, which was extraordinary in a 19th century demographic regime. And then Sorry. given the losses of World War I, it becomes yeah. this huge litany or this, this refrain that, that informs all of these arguments about the way in which policy is going to be directed towards children and mothers and families. Mm -hmm. And so what's very interesting about hearing mostly about the period up through the 1840s is that, of course, you have some of the same arguments and especially some of the same policies with very different, uh, I mean, the 1830s and 40s stuff about not wanting more kids from the poor is really, you know, striking when you get to what happens in the 1880s. So in any case, what's interesting about that, I think, is that, of course, right now, France has the Europe's Western Europe's highest birth rate. Yes. And so it's interesting to make a comparison to an earlier period where this whole question of uh, pronatalism is less intense, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you're thinking about the ways in which, I mean, there are obviously ways of spinning the question of the birth rate having to do with, the, you know, it being very high among immigrant populations in, mm -hmm. in France and all the anxieties that provokes right now. But the other thing that was that you expect to hear a great deal of when talking about the period from like the 1870s up through the Second World War is anti-clericalism and yes. the, the extent to which the Republican government that comes into power is very much saying we're doing things that are new, we're worried about Absolutely declining birth new. rates and we're worried about kicking out the church, they're monopolizing things, this is terrible for the health of the population. Absolutely. And so to hear your discussion of all of these continuities without a discussion of this rhetoric of anti-clericalism or pronatalism is just fascinating. And I'm wondering if you could sort of yeah. riff a little bit well, more on that. thank you. Um, I believe, and, and I'll cite the work, and I do cite the work of Sandra Cavallo on this, you know, has made what may be a very obvious point, but sometimes we forget obvious points. and. What her work she's shown or, or and or argued is that all political regimes, in order to legitimate themselves, 
or, or in the process of le legitimating themselves, at least in the European past over the long term, invent a way of helping the poor, articulating their obligations to the poor, and using policies and ideologies to knit together the, the political arrangements they're seeking to have. And they do it in different ways. Kings do it differently than the leaders of civic governments in the European past, uh, in, in part by entitling to differential relief different categories of people. Um, and so, not surprisingly, the French Third Republic, a very embattled regime, not, not that any French regime, you know, there, there seems to be a little path dependency on that issue too, but a particularly vividly uh, embattled regime, uh, sure, they, they had to reinvent everything new, they said, and um, uh, yeah, and actually in a very interesting uh, recent ar uh, article, Kimberly Morgan has uh, argued very interestingly about the importance of the religious variable in the history of the French welfare state. Um, so, uh, yes, so it's important, it became important gradually for the leaders of the Third Republic to articulate some view of their responsibilities to the poor. They didn't do such a great job on that assignment. Yes, they're still cheap, and that's, imp that's important. That's kind of cheese-pairing uh, regime. But, you know, we start getting medical assistance to the rural, you know, let's entitle a group of people that haven't had many benefits before. And that, that worked out pretty well. Um, but again, under the Third Republic, uh, I cited the work of um, Yannick Marek on Rouen, the huge uh, book, and uh, Paul Dutton's work on Lyon. A lot of innovative kind of civic local relief programs were under the Third Republic. So it wasn't just the, the leaders at the top but these innovations uh, at the at the city level sometimes uh, trying to take care of. Yeah, Charlie's been Charlie. uh, so trying to. Questions. Uh, I mean, one question was this. I, you know, I, I, was, uh, I wanted to hear about the church, oh. certainly for the earlier period and, and, cool. and the changing balance, but it's, it's a big question. The other uh, uh, the other question, I guess, is, you know, we're both formed somewhat in the laboratoire of David Landis, and oh, uh, I, you know, certain numbers, I guess, I, I would have liked. You like more have, numbers. I like more numbers. You know, do, how, when do the, if these, uh, these foundling homes are known as centers of mortality, uh, I mean, what is the, uh, what's the dilemma of turning kids over to them, and are they really, and, and families themselves, though, are they, uh, have high mortality in this sense, and when does this condition change, and what does that what does that do about uh, thinking about abandonment or or, or putting them babysitting or whatever you're going to do for a while daycare, uh, and I guess uh, yeah I, I just if I were listening to this as a public official now a non-historian oh. I would say to a certain extent well there's a certain plea I mean I'm very I lo sympathetic to it, and certainly to the going beyond the the old agenda of social control. Uh, but there's a certain, you know, would I couldn't I not turn then to my uh, constituents or others and say, look, you know, Professor Lynch has showed us that uh, in fact uh, non-statist regimes. Uh, do pretty well, and so uh, don't get so excited about rolling back the welfare state at this time. Uh, would I be? Uh, is that totally unjust? In, 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 in yeah, Sorry, but the, yeah. you have to be. You have to have it close. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, let me uh, let me take uh, those um, point by point, and you can remind me when I forget the first two. Uh, uh, rolling back the welfare state. Um, I guess what uh, what strike what I'm critical of in uh, a number of uh, works that I cited is, is the, the current of scholarship that tries to act as if the welfare state is hatched out of a whole new or brought on a whole new thing uh, in France is this what I see as a very uh, problematic. A distinction between public and private. And I know it's a very important 
distinction for in the law in the ment minds of many French people but it seems to me that a uh, this big tent history of the French welfare state is not a plea certainly not by me for the rolling back of state action it's to say might it ever happen in France that, that one could get beyond the public private the religious non-religious uh, discourse and really think about a mixed economy of welfare, maybe with a larger, or acknowledging the increasing role of voluntary organizations, not as some kind of embarrassing residual feature of the welfare state, but actually a point of pride. I mean, French revolutionaries thought it was a source of pride when citizens, you know, uh, be, uh, contributed and wanted to volunteer and uh, become well, involved. You know. David Cameron's pride, obviously, today. <laughs> yeah, I know, but but again, it's always it's coming out always as a sinister plot, and again, just about. But it's a uh, source you know, of pride, right? Only if it's effective. And absolutely. And, and to what extent do you study the efficacy? Uh, of, of these initiatives. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, it's also between targeted and universal. You know, it's whether it's stigmatized. I mean, private tends to be stigmatizing, et cetera. But, but and it's often religious, and, right. and I, can, I can absolutely talk about the religious variable, though not necessarily about the church. So um, uh, I'm just, uh, so I am not here as a spokesperson to advocate rolling back the welfare state. I'm simply, uh, I'm simply stating that understanding the, the history, the antecedents uh, of the welfare state, we have to be a little more inclusive. That that accounts that kind of start from a secular third republic point are just not very accurate, and that a lot of uh, different uh, ideas about civic mobilization and caring for one's community, you know happened there uh, uh, as well. It wasn't just uh, uh, state actors who were involved. So uh, I'm really now making a plea that I'm a historian. Okay, I'm, ple I'm, 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 making, I'm, I'm pulling out the historian card. And uh, so anyway, I don't know. Does that at all speak to? Uh, it, yes, I mean, I, I guess uh, I'm reassured. To a certain extent, I mean, it, it it sounds sort of nice, you know. Everybody chips in, you know, relief at this corner and that corner of the church, etc. And we know this is this is perhaps this is perhaps true. And uh, you know, I I, I I haven't had a thesis on the welfare state for a long time, but I had two, which essentially showed the variety of it. One was Peter Baldwin's on sure. uh, Scandinavia and England, and the other was Susan's, who yes. you know went to the Kess and the church. So. Uh, it's 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 fine, except I I I I just th I was just thinking of how this message might be re received in 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 part, and I guess I would, you know, at some point whether whether if you took a measure, you know, obviously uh, 1750 or 1830 or whenever, I'd like to get some sense of the shifting proportions of sources of aid, perhaps whether it's family or it's the mairie, the arrondissement, or the or the parish. I mean, I'm thinking of you know Bonnie Smith's old work in this and sure. Saint Vincent Paul and other things, and so I had a sense of the the movement from sector to sector as time went time went on and that would of course hold the third republic mm -hmm. um, I uh, am going to be working on budgets a, a lot of work on uh, budgets uh, uh, with the financial data on on French poor relief in the 19th century but let me say one other thing about this church state which is another very problematic barrier to me uh, that uh, the the problem there is that a lot of the activists uh, in this drama, it's not the church acting. It's people with religious views. It's lay people acting. It's not the church. Um, and uh, that, that's important. Uh, that's an important distinction uh, to me. Um, and, uh, and, and, and these are the people acting today. Uh, that are mobilized, and again, I'm not uh, 
So I'm not, uh, I'm not suggesting that uh, voluntary relief associations are going to be any substitute for the French welfare state. I'm, I'm asking one that the, the uh, combination of state and uh, citizen activism be acknowledged, that, that there was more than from church to state transition, that there is this mixed economy of welfare, uh, and that at cer certain points in time that was applauded. Why must it be a zero-sum game? Why cannot a, a stable Republican you know, uh, regime in France today now be more forthcoming about perhaps even a greater need for uh, citizen involvement since the devolution to the regions and localities, it's happened. It's happening now in France. It's uh, the responsibility, especially for the poorest of the poor, it's there. It, but I'm saying it's off the radar screen. Uh, Catherine Norris. Yeah, just one quick addendum to that, and then I'm going to shut up. Um, one of the things that I think you're bringing out and that gets um, that certainly I'm finding in some peculiar similarities between people you'd expect on the right and people you would expect on the, you know, sort of anarcho-syndicalist left of the early 20th century. One of the things to keep in mind is, of course, that public and private becomes kind of a mask for um, centralized and local, and the extent to which people want to get some kind of localized control as a way of, you know, differentiating regions or whatever, this is true in uh, at the turn of the 20th century, and it certainly comes out in what you've been saying, that if we just sort of take distinctions as public and private or church and state, we're missing a whole bunch of ways in which what we're looking at is kind of centralized top-down stuff versus localized volunteer things. And I think that kind of putting that, you know, if we look at this from an American perspective, we see very different meanings in some of these things. Absolutely. And so... The, the public-private thing is just com completely differently conceived of uh, on this uh, on this side of the Atlantic. But, but again, to, to get to your point more about efficacy, um, I, I, would you like to re-articulate your question and then see if I can respond to it? I, I, I don't know that I have any necessarily satisfactory measures of efficacy. Uh, certainly, uh, that was Charlie Mayer's uh, question about the mortality of children. Maybe I'll get back to that. But well, let, let, it, let it wasn't so much a question, just a, a, as a comment and, and to engage you. I mean, to um, simply say that there's this movement back and forth or that it's um, desirable to recognize the contribution of local charities or whatever um, uh, presupposes an interrogation of how effective local charities and regional efforts are. One of the reasons, at least in the United States, why there was a gravitation to more central control was the realization that voluntary efforts and local and, 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 lo and, local and state initiatives um, actually um, did not, were not efficacious. And so, yes, they're part of the problem uh, and part of the solution, um, but your your analysis sort of um, to some degree seems to obfuscate just how much of the problem and how much of the solution and therefore having some numbers and statistics would would illuminate this uh, much more effectively. And, and that, that will happen. Mm. Uh, I mean, mm. that it, there's a lot of data that needs that one needs to go through uh, from the welfare bureaus and so forth. But uh, also, I would simply respond that, yes, the insufficiency of voluntary uh, uh, or civic local systems of relief obviously are there, and the is insufficiencies of state, you know, state regimes is also under consideration now as well. Because of the levels of inequality, that it's not just the amount of money being expended, but who's getting it in France today. Uh, and a real concern uh, for uh, for the idea of those citizens who are more citizens than other citizens. And if you said, well, yeah, okay, that's true, but voluntary associations aren't necessarily going to help that. Well, uh, sure, that's true, but um, <coughs> mobilized communities from the grassroots can often do interesting things for their members as well to remedy some of the 
top-down inequalities that exist. That's all I, I would say. But also, to some extent, those very local philanthropic and charitable efforts are also the most vulnerable to economic fluctuations, uh, yes, even yes, more yes. so than the state, so to speak. Yes. You're absolutely true, as evidenced by insurance, you know, workers' insurance schemes and so forth. You know, and I don't mean schemes in a critical way, but you're absolutely right. Uh, we're just about out of time. Uh, yeah. James Chong, Sonia, but we especially want to hear from, give the opportunity from our historians of France who are here. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I have a, a, a very uh, brief but two-part question, and I'm going to go way out on a limb here and, and ask about maybe deconstructing the term welfare a little bit and, and talk about the pathology, the potential for pathology embedded in that term. And I, uh, I look at 20th century American rural voluntary organizations who had a very privileged relationship to um, state agencies as well as educational institutions. They were heavily involved in what I call improvement projects, but they were doing this at a time when the rural population was pathologized as degenerative um, and highly problematic for American citizenry. Um, the kinds of projects they did were, um, you know, health care projects, child care projects, having um, hot lunches and milk for farm children who couldn't uh, supposedly afford them. But, but a lot of that got constructed by the particular way that pr primarily experts pathologize that. And so that sort of got internalized. So I don't, I'm not sure whether, uh, and I, whether I want to see that, as, should I see that as partly a welfare type of activity? It, once, once we put sort of a proactivist or an agency, as, as Sonia referred to early, then it somehow becomes not welfare. Yet, even though some of the the um, problems that the activity is being directed at is is is, 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 sa is the same or similar. And just uh, quickly after that, um, for the 20th century American state and even late 19th, and as well I, as the European state in the late 19th century, expertise and professions are very important in um, defining um, problems, defining how policies um, should be enacted, um, defining what initiatives should look like. And I wondered if you could speak to that at all in terms of the role of that in... in um, on the welfare uh, idea, uh, I guess that the only thing I would say in the brief time we have is that it's another term that means such different things in France and in the United States. When we speak of a welfare state in Europe, uh, it can be construed as the opposite of some of the implications in our, uh, in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, a welfare state is one where citizens <coughs> have honorable entitlements uh, you know, from the state uh, that they deserve and uh, because of their status and so forth. Um, whereas in this country, uh, you're, you were asking whether you should consider some of your programs as welfare. I think in the United States, it has a, a, a more negative connotation as part of a uh, national system that grew up alongside of Social Security, which was the honorable part of the entitlements, and welfare was more for, uh, surely, the originally the, the deserving poor, but, uh, but a quite different sort of system. So I, I think it's difficult to, for a historian of France to, to look at a set of American programs and wonder whether it's right to call them welfare. I, I, I would be a little troubled by that. In, in terms of the, the notion of expertise, certainly uh, physicians uh, and uh, what we might call government experts were in on a lot of the, uh, certainly the critique of family institutions. And uh, but, the, uh, but there's a lot of, uh, vol again, uh, unpaid labor that goes into this liberal uh, kind of uh, poor relief program of the 19th century. Unpaid uh, women who visit the poor, uh, 
Um, uh, doctors are attached to welfare bureaus that get rather modest salaries. Um, but there is, uh, particularly I would say, medical, medical expertise and sometimes the kind of social sciences, social sciences, si social scientists in the making, documenting, uh, documenting some of these programs statistically. Um, but mainly health, health professionals surely were uh, involved uh, after, after the revolution. Okay, we have uh, reached the yeah. uh, limit of our time for discussion, but we would like to carry on uh, talking about these issues over a glass of wine, and we want to thank you for this very stimulating discussion. Well, thank you. Thank you very much.